So welcome everyone to our Ask Me Anything with Myra's Watershed Scientist, Andy Rusina. My name is Erica Wood. I'm the Outreach Manager here at Mystic River, and I will be um, helping to facilitate our AMA today. But without further ado, I will pass over to Andy for a short presentation. Thank you very much, Erica. I will need screen sharing. Privilege. Oh, yep, of course. Um, but um, great. I'm delighted to um, present on our water quality program. So I am Andy Christen. I'm watershed scientist at um, Mystic River Watershed Association. And let me maneuver to my screen. <clears throat> and um, I'm delighted to talk about our baseline monitoring program, which uh, we're immensely proud of, and especially in this year, because it's the 20th anniversary of this program. So <clears throat> I say a couple of things all the time about the baseline program, which is it, this is a monthly program where volunteers um, go out into the field to um, acquire samples, water quality samples in all weather early in the morning. Um, samples get tested in labs for a variety of parameters. We do some tests in in house. Um, and the the knowledge we gain and so these volunteers uh, go out this is a training we had uh, for volunteers uh, one year. We have about 40 people engaged in this program every month. And every month this happens, it, every time it comes around, I'm so grateful to these people, um, to all of the volunteers who contribute to, uh, to make this program happen. As the other thing I say is that it, the result of this effort, volunteer effort, is shared public knowledge that we have, that the Environmental Protection Agency has about environmental conditions that wouldn't exist if it weren't for these volunteers. So, I uh, uh, express my gratitude again. This year, as I say, is our 20th anniversary of this program. And unbelievably to, to me, at least four people, and there's, there are others lined up right behind these, guys, these folks, um, uh, have been volunteering every month for 20 years. And we celebrated them at our annual meeting and a shout out again to these um, intrepid uh, water quality monitors. Um, the, the data uh, they acquire forms a very large part of our annual EPA watershed report card, which we publish in collaboration with EPA every year. And we report uh, conditions on 11 different water bodies, I think, um, including, of course, the main stem of the Mystic River, the long green uh, extent here, uh, up the Mystic Lakes in the upper watershed, al along with other tributaries, so Alewife Brook and Winsbrook in um, in Belmont, for instance, the Aberjona River through Winchester and Woburn. Um, the good news this year, uh, and in many, many years, uh, in most years, uh, is that water quality in the Mystic River is actually quite good. Um, this is water quality measured by bacteria uh, concentrations, which is a sign of sewage contamination. And I always say that um, if you told me before I entered this field, if you told me 15 years ago that on a regular basis, raw untreated sewage gets into sort of every urban river uh, in uh, the US, certainly, rivers with uh, urban areas with old uh, infrastructure um, like ours, like every other city on the East Coast, I, I would have said, well, that's 16th century London, right? Not modern uh, American rivers, but it turns out to be true. There are a variety of mechanisms where untreated wastewater uh, gets straight to rivers. And this is a measure of the evidence of that if you just go out every month and grab a bottle of water and test it for bacteria. So the good news is the Mystic River, although sometimes impaired by bacteria, 
Um, for instance, last night with this huge heavy rain, there are uh, structures known as combined sewer overflows that are designed, literally designed to overflow flow a mixture of rainwater and raw sewage into, into water bodies as opposed to the street or as opposed to um, people's homes. And last night on the Charles River and on the, on the Mystic River, all the remaining CSOs went off uh, and the, it's just a chronic uh, and continuing problem very expensive to fix, which is why it's continuing. Um, but good news is the Mystic River and Mystic Lakes have great water quality almost all of the time, certainly in dry weather, um, but that the tributaries, as you can see, Alewife Brook and others are uh, show evidence of contamination. This is a, the same data reported uh, for last year um, by water body in graph form. And you can see that some, like the Mystic River itself gets an A minus, um, but some tributaries earn by these standards that are used on the Charles and elsewhere uh, an F or a D in water quality. Um, so there's good news in the, the vast uh, extent of the Mystic River, but um, uh, still a lot of problems and uh, places to pay attention. One success story you can see and one of the values of gathering data year after year, and that's the theme of the rest of this presentation, is just what have we learned over time and what kind of snapshots over time, um, is that you can see success stories. So this is data collected at Island End River in the lower watershed. Um, and you can see the grades steadily rise through uh, 2017, 18, and 19 from a D or an F to, uh, to a B level grade. And what this represents is literally finding a source, an illicit source or an accidental source in this case, it turns out, of uh, sewage contamination of the rainwater pipe network. Um, a, Literally two pipes were exchanged, uh, connected to the wrong pipe underground and buried for you know everyone to ignore for years. Um, and uh, they used a variety of methods to detect the source, fixed it, and what you see is the grade improving. There was a ra it's rather more sudden than this because we, we actually averaged the last three years of data. So if the, uh, the change really happened here in 2018 and uh, the, the grade ripple, it ripples out over the next couple of years. But that's a real success story. We, the data highlighted a problem. They went to look for the municipality, went to look for, a, for the source of the problem. They found it and um, the grade improved. Um, Sorry, let me. If you, what, one interesting thing we can do, and I, I, the, um, I'm throwing a lot of data at you here, but uh, consider the bottom row, for instance, which is the smoothest. Um, this is data from a, a variety of baseline um, uh, sites. So we weren't calculating the grade in the way, exactly the way we're doing now for all 20 years, but you can go, we have the data from those old years. So you can impose this rubric on them and say, what would the grade have been over, um, over time? And if you look, this is 2006 to 2019, um, you know, uh, Upper Mystic Lake has always, has always had great water quality. The Mystic River itself uh, has, uh, always had, it turns out, uh, surprisingly good water quality, certainly in recent years. Another success story you can see here is at Meeting House Brook, where again, a very specific uh, infrastructure change a few years ago has led to the improvement in the grade at that site. So we use this data to, we publish it, um, it uh, gets the attention of municipalities, of town engineers, of mayors, uh, and of EPA, and so, um, and of the Boston Globe, we, the first year we did this, we got a two, first two years, we got headlines in the Boston Globe, 
calling on municipalities to clean up their stormwater systems. Um, two more very quick snapshots of many years of data. This is 10 years of data, not 20, but um, this is dissolved oxygen, which is um, a, one of the parameters we test for. And dissolved oxygen, as you can imagine, is very important to fish. It's very important to plants. Everything needs oxygen. And this red, this red line shows the water quality standard in Massachusetts, which is five milligrams per liter. And most of the time, almost all our water bodies are above that five millig milligrams per liter threshold. Um, the, the big exception here is uh, number two, which is Alewife Brook, which for a variety of reasons, and really it's the history of, of uh, pollution over many years, um, creates very low dissolved oxygen in the summer. Um, and this is a chronic and unresolved problem. And it points to Alewife Brook as a, as a stream that um, can and should get attention uh, from the point of view of restoration. And finally, I'm gonna throw a lot of points at you now, but let me just describe what this is. So each column here or each row is um, one of our baseline sites and each column is a month of the year. So this is all the data from this site over 20 years um, in January. This is all the February data. This is all the um, March data and so forth. And what the parameter here is temperature. And so I just, uh, this is a really uh, undeveloped analysis, but I said, huh, we have 20 years of temperature data. It's always taken at the same time in the morning. Um, there's gonna be variability, but is there a trend over time that you can see? And if you, if you squint here, and I put in these regression lines, I, I think there's evidence here of seeing both earlier springtime uh, an upward trend over the 20 years in springtime temperatures and in the sort of height of summer in July temperatures, uh, for example, here at Meeting House Brook. Lots of explanations for this. One is just increased uh, pavement in the watershed, but one might be climate change. I think we might be seeing the signal of earlier springs and warmer temperatures in the water data, which is kind of cool. So that's the end of my uh, presentation, um, but I am super happy to answer any and all questions. Thank you, Andy. So one of the questions you already covered, it was um, about the Island End success story and what happened there. So thank you for reviewing that. Um, we have another question about the about baseline water quality monitoring. How do we choose the locations where um, where our samplers go? Oh, that's a really good question. So these, so uh, if you um, peer into this slide, there are little um, blue dots here, um, and those are those circles represent our baseline monitoring locations. Um, and there's a bit of a convoluted story here, but uh, basically the 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 uh, original study design was to look for, we knew that other agencies and um, in, in particular, the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority was sampling heavily in the Mystic River themselves. So that was being covered. But we also knew that we had polluted tributaries, polluted streams in outlying areas that were contributing pollution to the Mystic River. So when the original study was designed, it really focused on putting a location at the end of each of these tributaries or in the middle of the larger ones. So it was very heavily weighted to like kind of looking at what water, what streams are contributing water to the Mystic River and let's sample those and see where the problems are. And so this, that's what allows us to go back into this data and look at, you know, what does Alewife Brook look like compared to the Mystic River itself? Um, the original baseline design had only one sampling location in the Mystic River itself, partly because we knew that the, this other agency was taking care of the sampling. We've now brought in that data. We have a database, um, water quality database um, 
that houses our baseline data, but also can house other water quality data. So we've imported Massachusetts Water Resources Authority data from sampling. It's exactly like the sampling we do, um, uh, but uh, executed by them. And so we can incorporate those two data sets in our annual report card. So we have a very good image of the Mystic River, but also very good data from the tributaries. Awesome, thank you. Our second question is um, somewhat water quality improvement, somewhat habitat related. So um, someone has told a story about growing up on the Mystic Lakes and Mystic River in the 70s and fishing there and um, fishing or finding some, um, they characterize them as unremarkable fish, you know, a carp, alewife, and the waters were densely populated with weeds and it smelled really bad. Today, he's noticed that anglers are catching some pretty remarkable species um, of fish, a variety and size at the lake. And he's wondering if we can explain some of this improvement on the lake and why different fish might be seen there now. Oh, that's really interesting. So is this upper lake or lower yes. lake? Yes. Oh, um, says both the Mystic Lakes or does not distinguish. Okay. I, I ask only because there is um, uh, there is a dam between those two lakes. Mm -hmm. So there's it, it's not easy for fish to get from one to the other. Um, but there is a fish ladder now that allows fish during the uh, herring migration season to climb. So now one hugely remarkable change over the last um, even 10 years, right, is uh, that that fish ladder allows access to this big population of migratory river herring. So I would just point of privilege here, um, Alewife to me is a remarkable species. It, it, it lives in the ocean and it comes to freshwater to spawn and goes back to the ocean and returns again to the mm -hmm. stream it was born in. Um, amazing, actually. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. until 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there wasn't access to, um, uh, eight years ago, there wasn't <laughs> access to the upper lake. So you now have this huge population of spawning uh, river herring in Upper Mystic Lake, thanks to that fish ladder. Mm -hmm. And when the adults leave, you have an even huger population of juvenile river herring. And juvenile river herring are essentially eaten by every bigger uh, fish. So one thing that research has shown is that introducing herring runs to um, lakes that have been cut off from herring migration increases the abundance and uh, fitness of, of prey species, of predator species. And so what one effect you may be seeing is just a much richer food web for a variety of other species. It's also true that in horn pond, they stock horn pond with a variety of species. Um, and some of those may come downstream from the average, through the mm. average generation. Interesting. All right, well, we have one more question. I just want to prompt again, though, for anyone listening, if you have a question, if you're on Zoom, feel free to put it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, you can comment, but um, make sure to do that quickly because we just have one more in the books. So Andy, this is one, I uh, might be a little out of your wheelhouse, but I'd like to pose it anyways. The Outfalls near the Mystic Lakes, um, someone has noticed that oftentimes, even when it hasn't rained in a few days, we'll see a lot of water gushing out of the um, outfall on Lower Mystic Lake. And it, they're wondering if you know anything about that outfall and why they might be seeing water um, even when it's not raining. Um, well, so all, what I do, the only thing I know about this and it's not very deep knowledge. Is that, so there's an, as if you're at the um, at the dam, if you're between the two lakes and looking south at Lower Mystic Lake, mm -hmm. and go down the hill mm -hmm. um, on on the on the east side of the on the east side of the lakes. Um, it's a long Mystic Valley Parkway. Like, yep, on that side. Yep. <laughs> there is a, a kind of sluice way that introduces water. Uh, into Lower Mystic Lake. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, a, some 
engineered structure that's actually uh, connected to Upper Mystic Lake. And so if you see a flow at that location that's, that's um, controllable by the uh, DCR, which controls the dam and other operations there. So uh, sometimes they're releasing water from the upper mm -hmm. lake to the lower lake. Mm -hmm. And that may be what you're seeing. I know th there's the-, the It sounds the, like it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, that's my guess. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy. And if anyone, if you think of questions after the fact, feel free to email us or write it on the Facebook and we'll get back to you. But otherwise, thanks for joining. And thank you again, Andy, for answering our questions. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye now.